we'll get it figured out, right? So, okay, thank you. Nick Sapo, everybody. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm talking about Bitcoin and other blockchain-based assets. And... Um, So um, the origins of some of these ideas, we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little bit about the philosophy that, that many of us had when these ideas originated. Um, and our basic methodology was applying computer science to minimize vulnerability to strangers. Um, so with the, the rise of the internet and uh, Moore's Law making things cheap, the, the tools of computer science became very valuable tools for changing the world. And so we wanted to solve ambitious problems with them. Um, problems like how to privatize money, um, how to uh, non-violently enforce property and contracts. Really kind of ambitious, coming from a libertarian point of view, things that um, people had, had tried to do other ways, but the other ways kind of flawed. So our approach was, let's apply these new technologies and do this in a new and so out of, those, out of that um, work came ideas for smart contracts, uh, blockchains, and cryptocurrencies. And one of the philosophies we had was that um, trusted third parties are security holes. Um, most of our interactions we have in life in our modern economy, we're dealing with strangers, and they often involve a great deal of trust, you know, like giving of credit and that kind of thing. And so our philosophy, by contrast, is trust minimization. Design software and using the principles of computer science to uh, minimize the vulnerability of all parties to each other, um, the infrastructure providers, the counterparties, the third parties. Um, none of them should be more vulnerable to each other than is uh, necessary. And so one of these ideas, there was Wei Dai's B-Money and uh, my Bitgold idea. And Bitgold was pretty much a transparent attempt to um, say let's take the properties of gold um, the economic properties of gold such as unforgeable costliness but let's improve the security properties because gold I'd studied the history of money gold has been very insecure the uh, Spanish looted the Aztecs the English looted the Spanish um, FDR confiscated gold there's a lot of situations where gold was not secure enough to use and so uh, the idea was to use the tools of computer science to come up with something better. And so we can look at um, when Satoshi came out with Bitcoin, there's a lot of parallels between that and um, B-Money and, and Bitgold. Um, it, what it provides, it makes it distinct from the traditional financial system, which did not, for the most part, use these advanced principles of computer science. Um, it provides a strong trust minimized integrity, in other words, strong security for things that, like double spending and um, forging and that kind of thing. Um, so what does that give you? That gives you independence from financial institutions and it gives you seamless operation across the borders and the traditional financial system can't do this. The traditional financial system is very siloed. Um, so what that allows you to do is uh, a variety of global payments. So B2B payments, I was talking with a uh, venture capitalist who had invested in a French uh, startup. And it took literally several weeks because of bureaucratic snafus for just a wire transfer between the United States and France, which are two you know, developed countries, to, uh, to settle. And uh, that's, that, that's just preposterous. Um, from the point of view of using Bitcoin, you know, it settles in, in six, six block cycles. Um, so, uh, remittances, of course, um, routing around capital controls, uh, and a reserve currency. This one hasn't been used for yet, but it's something I envisioned when I was thinking of Bitgold and something you could still do with Bitcoin, is that governments and central banks could use a reserve currency when political distrust rises, when uh, wars break out, it's gonna be a lot more secure for them to be holding cryptocurrency than to be holding gold. 
and especially since a lot of the world's gold is held in trust in the United States anyway. Um, so another, another thing Bitcoin allows you to do is it, um, because it's not based on identity, it allows you to minimize forms. And so you don't have to, um, you don't have to fill out nearly as many forms. That allows things, for example, Stephanie was talking about tips, and um, it makes tipping just a lot more convenient and easier to meet, so people will do it more often. Um, now there's some companies that want to do micropayments and have a lot of nickel and dime charges with Bitcoin because um, at least Currently, the Bitcoin allows you to do that, and the future side chains will allow you to do that, technologically speaking. However, it adds worry back for the customer, and so um, I don't recommend doing that. I, I, I would say minimize the forms and minimize the number of repeated charges. Um, your customer. So, Bitcoin applications. Now, another big um, area that um, I'm really jazzed about is combining social networks with Bitcoin. So, for example, we see change tip in the tip box, and uh, excuse the pun, but that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg as far as <laughs> using social networks as a user interface to the blockchain. Because the blockchain is kind of a back office thing you don't see directly. And um, so you need user friendly interfaces for that, and it makes sense since money is a social thing, you're doing multiple people to do that off social networks and smart contracts off social networks also. Um, now, just about the only other altcoin, but it's much more than an altcoin that besides that uh, is worth paying attention to, is Ethereum, and that's because it's got a better smart contract language than Bitcoin. Um, you can think of the Bitcoin smart contract language. Satoshi was very conservative because he wanted to be Bitcoin to be first and foremost the currency that he used to kind of uh, reduce um, generality, pocket calculator type of um, scripting language. Whereas Ethereum has gone with a general purpose computer for doing smart contracts. Now the good news is uh, Sergio Lerner is working on rootstock, which would use Ethereum as a side chain to Bitcoin. So you could potentially, if you can make that work, you can get the best of both worlds. Um, that, that way you have the Bitcoin, the currency, which is a better currency than Ether, and you would have the smart contracting environment of Ethereum. So now let's talk about putting traditional investments on the blockchain. Because, you know, cryptocurrencies, because of the uncertainty of, you know, if it's going to go to the moon or fail, or the uncertainties, um, some of the other uncertainties surrounding it, um, tends to be more volatile in traditional investments. So people want to use Bitcoin to get to traditional investments. Um, so how can we how can we do that? How can we put traditional investments on the blockchain? So the current popular answer to that is colored coins, um, which is trust minimizing the transfer from one owner to the other. However, that does not um, trust minimize the cash flows coming at you. And so that's kind of the next generation of putting assets on the blockchain that's going to be doing that. And I'm working on that with uh, Donald McIntyre. It's a project I have right now. And so we're going to trust minimize the cash flows. And like Bitcoin, it should work the same and be trustworthy everywhere in the globe. So it'll be like holding a traditional investment, but it acts like Bitcoin um, and being looking the same, giving the same cash flows anywhere, anywhere you are. And so what's Bitcoin's role in this world of wider, of wider set of assets on the blockchain and of some other um, competing blockchains, private blockchains and Ethereum and so forth? So, um, Bitcoin is a settlement layer for seamless global payments, and it's still far better than that than, than any of the alternatives. Um, it's a reserve currency against political distrust and war. Um, as we saw, it reduces forms, it reduces customer worry. So all those, it's still, still better than the competition. And it's also a way to get from um, where you're at right now to the way to move money onto the blockchain and get to some of the, the more traditional financial assets which you might invest for in the long term on the blockchain. And so once we have financial assets on the blockchain, then you have a rich environment for doing smart contracts. Smart contracts just put on the blockchain today are kind of deaf 
blind and dumb. They don't have much to work with. Uh, once you get more financial assets on the blockchain, then, then you get a much richer environment. So that is my talk for today, and uh, please send any questions you have to my uh, email address. Thanks. Thank you very much, Nick. <laughs> um, yeah, let's give him a big hand. I think he deserves a standing ovation. Yeah. Let's, let's